It's gonna fix myself a drink. Would you like a drink? Thank you, no. For the Lord is my shepherd. And as a wise man once said, alcohol is your friend with a knife. My family's someplace safe. Not even you can find them. I'm not looking for your family. Is it still Thursday? These days feel like they run together. I know what you mean. I came to your fair city to do a simple job, which feels like ages ago, and yet here's me still, bamboozled at every turn. I told those ladies no harm would come to them. That makes me accountable. Should I tell you what I've learned about their criminal mindset? By definition, the criminal rejects accountability as their identity is based on getting away with things. Similarly, the criminal, you, rejects morality and ethics. For if there is a larger right, then the criminal himself is always wrong. And you don't strike me as the type of man who thinks himself wrong. Rarely. So there goes morality, out the window. But into that vacuum, what's your rush? But a code, a system of rules, mostly having to do with loyalty. And this way the criminal detaches himself from the civilian world. And yet here I am, family man, community leader, deacon in the church. <laughs> the criminal is capable of being all those things, but it's a ruse. For though you claim to share the values of your wife or preacher, the Lord knows it's a disguise. Ask me how I know for certain. How do you know for certain? Would a family man trade his youngest son to his enemy in exchange for power and monetary gain? You need to leave. And so, we circle back inevitably to your original statement to wit, I'm accountable for those ladies, murderers both, thieves and cheats. But now, since we both know the criminal is capable of love and loyalty only when it suits his own self-interest, I've come to make the following point. It don't. Not no more. In summation, boy, if you could sacrifice your youngest, like Isaac in the Holy Book, well then, given up two strangers to keep the might of the federal government off your back, well now that should be as facile as breathing. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> we Mormons are very friendly people. No. Pretty unfriendly, really. But it's the way you're unfriendly. Like you're doing me a favor. You're on a 10 o'clock train to Philadelphia. You didn't hear it from me. Hello, hello. Welcome to Killer Casting. I'm Lisa Zambetti. I'm a casting director in Los Angeles. And we're here to talk about all things Fargo. Fargo, 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 season four into the finale. But with me today, I have my sexy beast co-hosts and they are Brian Allen Hill. Say hello. Hello. And Dean Laffin from Down Under. Say hello. I'm also saying hello. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. How are you? I'm still a little bit uh, reeling because I own because of the difference in accessing uh, the show, uh, the finale. I only just consumed it half an hour ago, so I'm still processing the the final episode. So those things set things into motion. Having Loy give up the two women to Duffy 
is going to set something in motion that's going to come back to bite him in a really big way. Like a half an hour ago, I thought, eh, why don't I just start reading some criticism online about the finale, which... I don't like to do that much before we talk, but anyway, I decided to. And I realized that I did not see the last scene. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. I did. Yeah. So I had to rush and try to log back into it and watch the coda, which is just after the the credits. But I feel like maybe a lot of people could have missed that if they didn't stay because it didn't have a really good lead into the coda. But anyway, um, so I just watched that. And of course, it doesn't mean as much to me because I haven't watched the first few seasons, but I know enough about them, about what the significance is. Brian and I were just talking about it. Not angrily or with any disdain at all. Just <laughs> on, the, it. On, on the part of Brian, but I, I thought I was a smarty pants around episode two where, or three when I thought, wait a minute, I think that this X could be Y. And then, of course, I wasn't on my Pat Malone. It was <laughs> the whole world was thinking the same thing, but I didn't, I didn't know that. Right. So I think this is going to be part of the divisiveness between Brian, one of my best friends, and I. I wish you guys could see his face right now because he's just ready to rip. And I'm going to say this as a preface that All of the negative criticism that I've seen on this show has come from people mainly comparing it to the past seasons. That, for me, is not an acceptable platform for now. I I really want to be able to talk about the show this season completely as a standalone bottle season. But at the same time, because Holly and crew have decided to make the connective tissue Milligan, Mike Milligan, connect to season two. That's going to inform my response to how they laid out the season because it's almost like they wrote it backwards. That's what they wanted. That was the end goal was that reveal. And everything else prior to that is the buildup to that moment. Maybe, but if I feel like he knows his audience. He knows that the reveal was way back when you introduced Rabbi Milligan to this no, little kid. It's, so. it's, it's, a, it's a feature of every past season where there is something of a previous season mm. that no, no, in this case, no, absolutely not. No, no, it's not about- That's my it's buzzer. Not about, it's not about comparing the quality. It's not about comparing the quality to previous seasons. But when you set up connected tissue between seasons like that, that's exactly what he was going for. He's done it before. It is part of what they've done with Fargo, the show. Season two was a, was a callback to one. Season three was a callback to two and one as well. Right. There was a character that w- that existed in both. Right. And those Easter eggs are dear to the people who have been following these seasons. But for me, I mean, I'm just looking at it from a different point of view, even though I can appreciate those Easter eggs. So be- before we get into the final, final finale, we d- I just want to kind of talk to the lead up to the finale, because I mean, there are just these wonderful dominoes that start falling fast and hard in the lead up to the end. And as the machinations between the families escalate after Dr. Senator's death and this tit for tat trying to get each other where it hurts between the Fada family and the Cannon family really start to move forward. So we we have episode six where just the way it sets things into motion, I just love it. So Loy sets out to kidnap the older brother Gaetano and he sends his two convict ladies out there to do the dirty work for him, which is kind of hilarious for these kind of smallish women to have to overpower and get the mucho gusto brother. And on the other hand, then Josto sends out his man to kill Satchel, the, the little boy. So so there's a lot of tension and, and anticipation uh, on that. And Nurse Crazy Cakes, you know, she just can't help herself, even though she's been close to getting caught, but has escaped it a couple of times. She just can't help herself to continue killing. Is there anything to say about that that episode where Ethel Rita comes home to a birthday party with her parents and they all know that they've betrayed Zelmar, that they've told where the bad sister is? Anything to say about that episode. And we do keep coming back to this, me more so than Brian, but Brian also. But really, if you haven't seen Miller's Crossing and you've just watched a series four, just the sheer tonnage of references and, and when they take Satchel out, Brian, when he's taken out there to be executed and he's they're in the forest and that infamous scene in Miller's Crossing where the camera's dollying and it's upside down and the trees are all reaching up towards the sky. There's the exact opposite of that where the camera's pointing down 
uh, and and it's tracking the car as it's going through. That was uh, you know just yet another one of those little Cohen references uh, thrown in by Noah on, on on this ep. This is one of the problems that I have with the show. The person who takes out to be killed becomes a focal point. He just comes out of nowhere. We have these people in each game who kind of enter in and, and are kind of like deigned to be significant when I have no point of reference for them in any other previous scene. They just show up to fulfill this function of being, in this case, the guy who takes out Satchel to kill. And we see like a moment with, he's living in the house. Is he a brother? No, we see him before. We've seen him in all the episodes with him. He's always the sort of long-faced right-hand person that Gitano, the brother, is kind of trying to push to to get his loyalty. I mean, he's the right hand holding the umbrella over Jason Schwartzman, the rain. I mean, so he's there. And this is kind of speaks to what Dr. Flo was talking about our last episode, where there are so many people in this world. And are you ever going to get to know any of them? And, and in this case, you do. You see all of them get a chance to tell their story. And I appreciated that. So he's not just a goon. I mean, he's a person and, and he has a family and he's got to pick up the kid and drive him out there. I mean, I disagree that he is has any kind of significant role prior to that. Not in the way like James Vincent Meredith had, or even Lloyd Cannon's man who had the the messed up eye. It just seems like that there is a an unevenness in terms of how all of these henchmen across the board are handled and how they're put into use for the purposes of moving the story. Well, right, but but not everybody can have their story. I mean, it, it has to be uneven. I mean, you can't have everybody's story all equal at the same time. I mean, it has about, to be it's about equal. It's mighty convenient. A lot of this storytelling. That that's my that's my opinion about like that that scene. And then to leave him out in the cold like a dog to not give him a proper burial. But that tells you about. Jason Schwartzman's character, that tells you about Justo's character. That's what that's about. So this is interesting. In, in, the ne- <laughs> in the next episode, the next big sort of thing that sets bad things into motion is when the bosses meet to try to broker a peace and, and trade the brother for the son. And Justo tells Lloyd Cannon's character that, in fact, his son has been murdered. It's not a smart thing to do, or is it? I wasn't sure in the storytelling, like, what good that does, except to set Loy on a collision course and a, in, into a rage that his own son has been killed. And to show that Loy is not like that, like he can't exact the same revenge over the little boy who's in his care. He's tempted to lash out and kill the Italian boy that is in his care, but he ultimately doesn't. I think it's telling when revenge is attempted. It's not by his crew. It's by the, the other white gangsters who have offered their allegiance or the, the weapons. They're the ones who lash out. But that's saying that Loy's a better man, isn't it? He's the better man and the better father. My son's dead, but another dead son would be another grieving mother and I'd be as bad as them. There was one point where he said, the Italians can't climb up to our level, so they're trying to drag us down to theirs, and I'm not falling for it. Debbie makes the compelling case to Loy about giving up the ladies because it's like, if you're willing to give up your son in trade to acquire power, it's like, then you should have no problem to keep the peace. Like, give me these women. I was going to mention that scene because it's actually, you've spoken earlier, Brian, about Chris's dramatic acting chops. And I thought that that was a really good scene because he was sort of in control. He's the one doing whatever. And then uh, Dicky drops that on him and you just see his face drop. It really hit him. You could see that it hit him to the core. And then he just rolls over and just gives him up straight away. And he's laughing. And not only does Lloyd, he's not only not able to kill the little attack boy in his care, but he ends up not killing Gaetano, the brother that he's kidnapped. And he lets him go and just leaves it to that to play out between the brothers for, for that betrayal. It's just so it's interesting. That wasn't because he's a nice guy. That was because he expected Gaetano to go back and, you know, and, and take out Josta. You murdered the child. To have me killed. I'm so proud of you. (laughs) My brother. (laughs) He's clever. Our enemy, the Molignan. When he let me go, I think, why does he do this? Hmm. But then I, I said, yeah. I think to kill you. 
And I realized he wants me to do this. To murder on my brother and take over this family. Because I'm the lion, but you are the snake. Hey, folks, if you're enjoying this podcast, feel free to give us a review. Big thumbs up in your listening app of choice. Plus, if you know someone else who'd like the show, send them a link because sharing is caring, right? Now, back to the show. So those things set things into motion. Having Loy give up the two women to Deffy is going to set something in motion that's going to come back to bite him in a really big way. So it's so interesting, the things that start flipping. So, so Josto thinks that Loy is going to kill his brother, but no, Gaetano comes back and kicks his ass. But then what happens? He's like... My brother, you're the smart one, which I thought was so interesting. I don't know what, okay, Brian. I mean, after everything that's been set up, and we even talked about him being the Fredo of crime bosses or whatever, it was it was too, too sharp a turn for me to just like buy into. I just couldn't. I was like, this defies everything that has been set up prior. And again, it's convenient storytelling. You need it for what comes in a couple episodes or a few episodes you've seen to that have that kind of turn into like I'm the bull I'm the lion you're the snake all I could think of as they were talking was like what's the matter you da, 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 da. why are you looking so sad it's a not so bad you remember that song when we were kids Lisa the it's a place the worst kinds of cliches just droppings well for me it defied cliche it it because you, you normally that scene would go the brother comes back and exacts his revenge and takes over the family and I thought it, it was really interesting to have him turn to understand that it's not going to work without the brains he's not going to be able to run the family clearly without his brother's brains and so I, I thought it was an interesting turn for me I've got sympathies for both sides of that argument Lisa because I'm just thinking as you're describing it as an element in as a script device or as a device i think it works but as brian said the actual realization of it in the performance by gaetano i didn't buy it either i'm like how does this rampaging lunatic almost uh you know almost a psychopath then suddenly just become a loving brother uh, it was a 180 degree turn i couldn't buy it but i think that was on the performance but i felt he was pretty two-dimensional throughout didn't you think brian as a you know he's swaggering and he was almost a cartoon that guy um there are other great performances but i don't think that was one of them but that's the reaction that just still has right are you kidding <laughs> you know i mean i think that he's as bemused by it as well but i bought it and i i thought it it just added something unexpected and not your normal just not the normal way that these these things tend to go it all comes down in this incredible homage to the untouchables in well, the train wait, station we, scene we there, where we get there, oh, okay. because you're absolutely right okay sure that homage to the untouchables like shot in the train station i mean as soon as i saw it i was like Oh, there's Untouchables. There's another homage. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody mm. who saw that. There's another that homage that. later on too. We can talk about, it, right? Okay. Um, but but okay. So uh-huh. but the reveal of Jack Houston, his character Otis being like twitchy, like from the time he was a kid, and that whole conversation with Deffy, you know, like being on the full phone with Lloyd Cannon and all that. I was screaming at the television. It's like first of all. If you are twitchy and an army psychiatrist said that you are touched, you're not going to be a minesweeper in the war. And then you're not going to be allowed to be on the police force. And then when Deppy asked him, like, who are you on the phone with? Lloyd, he wants to know that they get apprehended or killed. Come on, you corrupt cop, and come with me. I mean, how Deppy deserved to die? Fuck that guy. I mean, it's like, if you're going to believe this guy who you know is corrupt, you know what I mean? It's just like... And, and, and as much as I said the other day, like I like Jack Houston's performance, and I do, those story points, again, I don't mind a, a willing suspension of disbelief. That is what we grew up with in theater and in storytelling. But at a certain point, if it defies all logic, it loses the ring of authenticity. 
that, but I think a lot of these characters think that they're smarter than the other. So I saw that as the Marshal Duffy. Well, per his nickname, Duffy, he doesn't listen. People tell him things and he doesn't listen. And he thinks that he knows best. And he thinks that he can proselytize someone into changing. And so for me, it was more just about his hubris. And like, he's Dudley. He literally looks like Dudley Do-Right. And that's who he thinks he is. But the fact that Otis is even on the police force. I mean, maybe standards were different, but I don't think they were that different. A guy with a with a service record that details like being shell shot. Yeah, I think that that's okay because I know that in the time period, of course, all kinds of people are going to be on the police force. We know that. We know that there are all kinds of people with all kinds of pasts on the police force. So I, I definitely didn't bump on that. Was it just me, or did Deffy remind you a lot of uh, Michael Shannon's character? Nelson Van Alden from uh, Boardwalk Empire, super religious, super straight, straight G, but underneath he was just twisted. I haven't watched it. Oh, really? Did you see it, Brian? I haven't, no. Okay. Well, when you do, I think you'll see the uh, another one of Noah's little sort of Easter eggs there. But yeah, no, like De- Deffy's not, uh, he considers himself very moral, but he's not. He is, on the surface he is, can't go around killing people if he was really religious. So I don't think anybody, even if you haven't seen The Untouchables in a million years like me, could not mistake the lead up into this scene where U.S. Marshal Duffy has finally tracked down his two convict ladies. And I adored the composition of the scene. I I loved just the timing of it, the tension of it, the use of movement of the crowd. I thoroughly enjoyed watching it, just the anticipation of it all going down and, and watching Duffy go through the crowd to try to chase after Zelmar and Swanee and just wondering, okay, when Otis is in the car and he can't get out and he can't get out, looking back, I'm not sure. Is he doing that on purpose? Is he waiting on purpose? Does he genuinely not able to get out of the car? And so when he comes into the scene where there are just bodies everywhere and the aftermath of the shootout has happened, Otis comes through the bloodbath and finds Deffy, has his gun on the two convicts and is ready to arrest them. Were you surprised that Otis comes upon them and shoots Steffi or did you see that coming? I didn't. I didn't know why he did it. Did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Folks, this is an audio medium, so it's a little <laughs> difficult to tell, but Brian just threw up his hands and went, I don't know. I got no idea. Visually, and it's clearly a homage. And to the extent where at one point, Deffy is running down the stairs and he's pushing people out of the way in slow motion, exactly like Kevin Costner did. I think there's a baby carriage in there somewhere too. No, you know what? Your brain probably put it in there. I looked and there's not one, but but it looked like there was. But it also, there's in in the lead up to it, there's um, Zelma and Swanee sitting there. They're in the train station. They're almost out, but they're about to get it. Does that make you that little description? Have you guys seen Al Pacino in Carlito's Way? Yeah, He's yeah. at the train station. Oh, and by the way, De Palma. Mm-hmm. Oh, hello. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess from a strategic standpoint, Otis says Lloyd wants me to make sure that they get apprehended or killed because he doesn't want it to come back on him. So it makes sense that he's got to kill Deffy because he can't be a witness because the next thing he does is kill Swanee and then tries to kill Zelmar. Yeah, I mean, I was confused. At first, I was thinking he killed Duffy because he was just tired of having this conscience on his shoulder and he just needed to silence it. Now what you're saying, obviously he has to kill him if he's going to get away with killing the ladies. So Otis um, shoots Swanee and it's like, I mean, uh, I've come to like that character so much, but you know that she's, you know, she knows she's going to die. He, everybody knows that she's going to get it. And Curiously, Zelmar survives. I mean, she just charges Otis with this just strength and rage because she loves Swanee and seeing her die. And she gets away. And that's not a good thing <laughs> that she gets away. Well, you saw that Swanee saw the ghost. Yes. yes. In that sequence just before all hell breaks loose. And then the two of them, when uh, Zelmar sees Deffy and she knows it's on and they stand up and it was a great scene where Swanee throws back and pulls out her pistols like something out of John Ford Weston or something. Then it touches of Thelma and Louise too. They know they're going over the cliff, right? Right. And seeing the fact that Swanee saw the ghost, I mean, I know that Brian will thinks that's just inconsistent, bad storytelling. And for me, I was like, why is it, if it's not her story, if it's not her family, why is it that she can see the specter of 
death and evil? I mean, I guess for me, it's just sort of an existential question. We all have the hair on the nape of our neck rise sometimes when something is off, when something feels off. And so for me, it was just a representation of that. But I can see how some people would be very confused. Why would she be able to see? When we finally get an explanation for who that is, they give it a solid motivation. And then you go, let's engineer backwards. And then that's when questions start popping up. If it is the curse of this family represented in this specter, then what does it mean to Oreta? What does it mean to Swan? I can understand why the family senses it. But then there's not a consistency in what that represents that. Because you can make an argument with, with episode 10 that it's a protector too. Like maybe it is turned. I don't know. Once you give it a solid history and a solid meaning, definition, then it becomes really, then the speculation becomes like, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't know. Yeah, I agree that finding out what the specter really was, was less exciting than when I didn't know what it was. Because in a weird way, I understood what it was from a just a gut level. As an audience member to just kind of like, this is suspension of disbelief right? To allow that this exists in this world and to wonder and to be engaged by that. You know, that's cool. I wonder, is, is he just a metaphor for imminent death? That's what I thought, but I don't think so. Well, Swanee sees him and she, then she dies. Well, he kind of saves Ethel Reader. And so I'm just sort of wondering if it's something about that, but it's a bit fuzzy. I don't think so because he he appears also in the coffin in the funeral parlor when Loy's other son, Lemuel, is just kind of delivering boxes and shit. And he just kind of walks into the funeral parlor and, and it's there. So, yeah, it, it was really inconsistent and which is OK, but not when it's defined as something as being very consistent. So, yeah, for me, that was a that was a thumbs down. Uh, but any hoodle. OK, we got to talk about episode nine. Oh, <laughs> Before okay. we go to episode nine, okay. okay, I referenced the scene a little bit ago. Okay, so when the allies of uh, Lloyd Cannon come and start shooting up Gaetano and Justo, there's six or seven guys with Tommy guns shooting at two guys. Gaetano comes out with two handguns, doesn't get hit by a single fucking bullet, and yet the spray of bullets reaches the house and kills their mother and wife or sister, whoever the fuck the other woman is. And, I, and I'm watching the scene. I'm like, you want to talk about fucking convenient. It's like, come on. I mean, really, it defies, it defies physics that all of those guys are such a bad shot, and yet they can hit the two women in the house. Come on. That was, that was lazy. Terrible. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Episode nine. Wow. This is one of those things that I'm trying to think of other examples of it in TV shows that I've seen, and I can't quite put my finger on it. It's not exactly a bottle episode, which is kind of an inside baseball term for us. How would you define a bottle episode, Brian? I've never heard that term. You haven't? No. Really? I'm very inside baseball. Oh my gosh. So a bottle episode is usually an episode that takes place in one set. Like for Criminal Minds, like we always go to a different town, blah, blah, blah. We had a bottle episode that just took place in an interrogation room. We basically didn't see anything else except for maybe flashbacks. So a bottle episode is just an episode that has a very different feeling that it, that it only requires one set or a limited number of casts. You know, it used to be about saving money. So you don't have so many sets and so many cast members, but it has come to mean that it's a, a, a special episode that is very condensed and focused on on something else than the normal trajectory. This is, this, is my, this is my only question before I dive into the complaints that I had. Tell me how this episode moves the story. I don't care. Well, it does move it. How does it move the story? Satchel's protector is killed and is, he's left on his own. Does that 50 minutes tell that story well? Yeah, I think so. Now, if we could find a million shows that you love, Brian, where I could ask that same question and you would be like, oh, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, you know, if you weren't into it, you weren't into it. And that's that's fine but, in itself. But there's, but, but there's so much there's so much filler in this episode, you know, and painting the outside of the filling station, the conversation, the bandage man. Do you know who the bandage man was? Yeah, I do. Yeah. The guy who played the Irish. Yeah. So. 
And so did Andy Rothenberg. He makes an appearance. It's just because it's like Wizard of Oz, how you have actors and characters from one part of life that come back into this dream sequence. So it's a dream sequence. It felt very dreamlike. Look, they could have done the exact same episode in color and had it be a very straightforward scene, but instead it did take on this quality, you know, not only being in black and white, but this very eerie quality that I really enjoyed. Yeah, it was it a flex, like a very obvious flex of directorial choices. Absolutely. Not but just I, directorial, not just, but I mean, but in the writing as well. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was weird. I thought it was creepy. It felt like a film. It felt like a totally different film that we'd entered, uh, some kind of surreal or expressionistic film. I loved the exploration of it for sure. And there was just like a feeling of dread throughout the whole thing. And it's very disquieting. You know, hopefully everybody's seen the episode because I'm not going to go through the whole ins and outs of it. But even some of the occupants of that hotel, the guy who's like really loud and in your face and really jarring, and all of the weird people in all the different rooms. And I found it really interesting and macabre. And I, I don't know, I dug it. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Lisa. And I get Brian's technical criticisms of it, but almost as a self-contained, as you said, like a little mini movie all of its own. I, I loved it. And, you know, the obvious references, I mean, they really went into Kitty Land, right? So it's a totally reflective of The Wizard of Oz. At the same time, we get a retelling of Yertle the Turtle, and then Goldilocks gets a mention. And of course, the whole thing's about The Wizard of Oz. So there's that, that all that thing going. But I don't know if you clocked the very, very opening sequence of this, where the camera is sort of just pushing in over a wreckage of the house. And you're like, well, it's just mayhem. And you're thinking, where are we? And what's happened? And the camera pulls over a book, which was, the book was titled The History of True Crime crime in the Midwest. And then as the camera keeps going, there's one page that's stuck to a shard of timber and it's flapping in the breeze. And it's the start of a chapter. And the chapter is called who shot Willie Bupa? And I'm thinking, well, this is no accident. Wonder how this is going to play out. And of course, then you get told. But again, now we're having these little, these little fun, which was I thought that was fantastic. I just loved it. For me, it's just so rich. It's just so different than anything that I've seen in a while. And I love the detail, like you say, Dean, that drone shot coming in. I, I loved all the different shots, all the makeup of the scene, all the compositions of the scenes, the color, the contrasts of black and white. It definitely felt like you'd gone back in time. It had a real retro feeling to it. The twister, I couldn't even believe it. When, when I saw the twister, I was like, no, no, they're not going to do that. I don't know. For me, it's just... Lisa, what's the device where the weather reflects the mood of the characters and it's ominous and there's a storm brewing, literally? Ooh, there's I don't a, know. There's a, isn't it, there's a phrase for the sympathetic fallacy? Is Ooh, that, I don't is know. That, is, is that right? I should have looked it up before with the pod, but anyway. But yeah, I, I, I thought that was really cool. And Brian, did you clock when Rabbi drives them into that, into that hotel? Did you see the sign as they pulled the car around the corner? Martin Arts, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Barton Arms Hotel. <laughs> all right, all right. So hold that thought, Brian. Hold that thought, Dean. We we have so much more to talk about. We have to pause now, go back to our corners, have a beverage, think about what we've said, <laughs> think about our actions. <laughs> and uh, when we come back, we will resume our discussion of the, the finale of Fargo Season 4. Talk to you later. This is Killer Casting signing off. Killer Casting is a concept created and produced by Lisa Zambetti. Audio engineering by Dean Laffin. Logo art by April Laffin. Website and Big Fat Opinions courtesy of me, Brian Allen Hill.
We need your help, Happy. The family. He ain't my family. My mama and yours, like sisters, which means his kids are your family. His wife is your family. That makes him family. I got a cousin on death row. You want me to do what? Sit in the chair with him when the switch get thrown? I need leverage. Short term. Just some muscle from the country to puff me up. Show people I'm here to stay. That's a Costa Nostra, boy. This ain't no podunk thuggery. You think you're gonna what? Drive him out of town? Don't need him gone. Just in their place. This pressure from New York, none of us can afford a war much longer. You got all the slaughterhouse boys on your side. Texas cousins smuggling from Oklahoma. Shit, you make me sound like a big deal. <laughs> Maybe you should be helping me. I told you this was a mistake. Lionel Holloway, stop messing around. You want to talk about all boats rising, that goes both ways. It don't matter if you think we should be in this war, we're in it. They killed my son, 10 years old. What did he ever do to anyone? And they killed him. And now they want to snuff us out. Us. Because after they string me up, they coming after you.
You murdered a child. To have me killed. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> My brother. <laughs> He's clever. Our enemy, the Molina. Yeah. When he let me go, I think. Why does he do this? Hmm. But then I, I said, yeah. Waiting to kill you. And I realized he wants me to do this. To murder on my brother and take over this family. Because I'm the lion, but you are the snake. I apologize, brother, because I think you're weak. And now I know what's true. To say, el camaleonte. <laughs> Nel silenzio della notte, sotto la luce delle stelle e lo splendore della luna, io prometto di proteggere il mio saggio fratello e di fare la sua volontà. I accept this oath of poison knowing that from now on, no man will judge you, but that you will judge yourself. And that if you ever betray me or this family, questi brutali sono per te. I swear. Come here. We're closed. I'm here to see my son. You know who I am. Of course. Please, come in. I've been here before. Maybe five years past. Friend of the family, cancer. Got a real nice service. We take our role here very serious, <laughs> as the shepherd to the sheep. Anything stronger? Thurman keeps a bottle on the top shelf. Whiskey, I think. That do. I can't help you. You're going to pour me a drink and we're going to get to talking. How we grew up on the same street, know the same people, and then you're going to ask me for help. 
And I want to go ahead and let you know up front that's not going to happen. This is our home. Been in my husband's family since the century's turn. People who come to my husband looking for money at the end of their rope, and, and they all think the same thing. I've got nothing left to lose. But there's always lower you can go. My youngest son was killed. We can't know his plans. All we can do is have faith. Amen. Does your eldest know? You have daughters also, I think. Mrs. Cannon, we have made mistakes, my Thurman and me. Lord knows we're not the angels we try to be, and we're not looking for charity. Just the opportunity to make things right. I told you. My girl turns 17 years old this week with dreams that take my breath away. It can't be that she falls because I was too stubborn or weak to ask for help. We will make it right, whatever it takes if we get a fair shake. I wonder if you would hold the service. It would be my honor. achetaient leurs journaux et puis tous ceux qui prenaient le métro il y avait la parade des boulevards les boniments du vieux camelot bavard des familles rentrant dans l'eau sale des ruisseaux le ciel d'avril qui faisait le beau dos what are you studying there French. Ooh, la la. Uh, excuse you? You got some pretty decent tunes here. Those are my dad's. Most of it's a little off the cob. This one ain't half bad. You like jazz? Enough. Who's your favorite horn player? Mm, Louis Armstrong. Yeah, everybody says Louis. What about Dizzy? Oh, there's this new cat, Charlie Parker. Everybody calls him Bird. It's a new sound. No structure. Just go where the music takes you. I like structure. Yeah, I would have guessed that. How come you know so much about music? I'm a horn player. Trumpet. Then why are you lugging boxes? Oh, that. It's just an experience. Everything in life's an experience, from climbing a mountain to scrubbing the toilet. You climbed a mountain. No, but I've scrubbed a few toilets. <clears throat> Your mom is here for you. Poor boy. You keep your distance from him. You hear me? I didn't do anything. He's your captor, not your friend. And you can't afford to make mistakes.
Uh, 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 nurse Tapley, my neighbor word. I'm on rounds. Uh, of course, it's just I heard Dr. Harvard took a turn for the worse, poor soul, and I can't seem to find the room number in, in, in the He's ledger. He's transferred. Transferred? To a hospital specializing in the treatment of poisons. To the, uh... Attempted murder, the authorities think. No. I kid you not. I saw the test results myself, positive for strychnine. So given the attempt prior resulting in the shooting death of Mrs. Will, the authorities thought it best to transfer Dr. Harvard out of state until he can make a full recovery and offer evidence on his assailant. Jeez. Dr. Harvard, I've worked alongside Orietta Mayflower for many years now and felt that I should bring certain actions of hers to your attention. In the last year, many of Nurse Mayflower's patients have died under mysterious circumstances. After each death, Miss Mayflower has made it a habit to attend their funerals. She has also been known to steal personal items from her patients after their death. Not to mention, I have it upon good authority that she has pilfered an abundance of potent narcotics from the hospitals at which she has been stationed. Dead patients, misappropriated personal items, stolen medication. I suppose you have to ask yourself, is this the kind of nurse you trust around patients in your fine establishment? I'm gonna change my clothes and splash my face. You right here. in the wrong neighborhood, Slim. You need to turn your ass around and hop on back to your ride. Don't worry. I got no wares to sell. Oh. I got me one of those, too. Makes a pretty sound when it fires. Kind of like Chinese New Year. But maybe instead of the six-shooter, you'd rather see my badge. Keep it real shiny. U.S. Marshal. Backed by the power of the mighty American Eagle. And if that old raptor could talk, he'd say, son, stand aside now. But there's no power on earth that can keep a U.S. lawman from the execution of his duty. He won't miss say all that again.
gonna fix myself a drink. Would you like a drink? Thank you, no, for the Lord is my shepherd. And as a wise man once said, alcohol is your friend with a knife. My family's someplace safe. Not even you can find them. I'm not looking for your family. Is it still Thursday? These days feel like they run together. I know what you mean. I came to your fair city to do a simple job, which feels like ages ago, and yet here's me still, bamboozled at every turn. I told those ladies no harm would come to them. That makes me accountable. Should I tell you what I've learned about their criminal mindset? By definition, the criminal rejects accountability as their identity is based on getting away with things. Similarly, the criminal, you, rejects morality and ethics. For if there is a larger right, then the criminal himself is always wrong. And you don't strike me as the type of man thinks himself wrong. Rarely. So there goes morality, out the window. But into that vacuum, what's your rush? But a code, a system of rules, mostly having to do with loyalty. And this way, the criminal detaches himself from the civilian world. And yet here I am, family man, community leader, deacon in the church. Oh, the criminal is capable of being all those things. But it's a ruse. For though you claim to share the values of your wife or preacher, the Lord knows it's a disguise. Ask me how I know for certain. How do you know for certain? Would a family man trade his youngest son to his enemy in exchange for power and monetary gain? You need to leave. And so, we circle back, inevitably, to your original statement, to wit, I'm accountable for those ladies, murderers both, thieves and cheats. But now, since we both know the criminal is capable of love and loyalty only when it suits his own self-interest, I've come to make the following point. It don't. Not no more. In summation, boy, if you could sacrifice your youngest, like Isaac, in the holy book, well then, giving up two strangers to keep the might of the federal government off your back, well, now that should be as facile as breathing. I like you. <laughs> we Mormons are very friendly people. No. Pretty unfriendly, really. But it's the way you're unfriendly. Like you're doing me a favor. You're on a 10 o'clock train to Philadelphia. You didn't hear it from me. Hmm. See, I knew we could figure this thing out. We just put our minds to it. You want my advice? When you cross the state line, don't come back. It ain't safe for you in Missouri no more. You boys have a nice day. On my signal, Alpha Team will enter through the main doors. Beta Team will penetrate through the rear. <laughs> Someone want to let me in on the joke? Fine. So 10 o'clock to Philadelphia. Track three. Remember, these subjects are to be considered armed and extremely dangerous. Any questions? Then let us bow our heads for Psalm 91.3. 
Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. Amen. Amen. Dismissed. I said it with you. I, I want in. Look, I've been thinking about what you said. I just want to be a cop again. No bullshit. All in. Sure, partner. Just tell me one thing. Who's on the phone? And before you lie, just know I ain't been fooled by man or beast since Hitler was still giving speeches in beer halls. It was Louis Cannon. Go on. He wants me to make sure you get those girls. Doesn't want them coming back on him. Get hell. Just to make sure they're caught or killed. Okay, then. Now, what was it you were saying about being a cop again. This is, this isn't a choice. I got a condition. <laughs> when I was a kid, the teacher said, oversensitive. The army shrink told me I, I worry too much, which, how can you worry too much when you're at war? Those things you call me, twitchy, touched. I've been hearing that my whole life. All I know is I, I feel better when I'm in charge, when I got the power. That's why I joined the force. No, because cops have power. So now I'm on the street, I'm the boss, except turns out being a cop's real risky. Risky makes me nervous. So I, I make a deal with the street. I take a few bucks, I look the other way. Less risk, but also less power. So here comes that feeling again. Like I'm... I'm drowning on, on dry land. You know what worries me? Diane with one boot on, caught short. It's a petty death. So let me throw you a rope. You want to die like a man, you got to live like a man. Get it. Get some sweets. That sweet tooth's gonna kill you one of these days. I'll wrestle you a lollipop. Go on then, shake it like. What'll it be, sir? Give me five of them Clarks, three bit of honeys, and a couple of Abba Zabbas. like these, my mind goes back to the wisest words I ever heard. And forgive me for the blueness of the final stanza, but here it is. Behold, the amazing pelican, whose beak can hold more than his belly can. He can hold in his beak enough food for a week. I'll be damned if I know how the hell it can.
Geronimo. to miss this place. I was just getting accustomed. You and me both? Mm. Hitting them eye ties is some of the most fun I ever had. <laughs> Feral monkeys. <laughs> Our objective is to bring them in alive. But if they engage, drop them where they stand. Let's go.
Drop them now, ladies. Over here, I got them. They ran out of bullets. That a boy, Wes. Come on, I need you. Cuff him. Che non lo trovo. I sent him after Milligan and the kid. Huh? Antoon was supposed to shoot the kid, but Milligan shot him first, took the kid, and they flew the coop. So Calamita's gonna run him down. So you tell our enemy his son is dead? You know, Irish, that's a run straight to him. <laughs> Just uh, the python. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come here. Come here. Come here. Boys, I come inside. It's freezing out. In a minute, Ma. No, come now, before you catch a cold. We're not little boys anymore. We don't catch cold. Ah, oh, such disrespect, huh? And me, just a poor old woman who loves her sons. Oh, Mom, you know, we love you. We're talking about business. Parliamo di soldi. Money. Ma, come in. Ma. Come on. <laughs>
See you there. Hello. F you. Hi from Down Under, it's Dean here in Melbourne, enjoying our uh, excellent recap. Killer Casting is a concept four. created and produced by Lisa Zambetti. Audio engineering by Dean Laffin. Logo art by April Laffin. Website and Big Fat Opinions, courtesy of me, Brian Allen Hill. Hey folks, if you're enjoying this podcast, feel free to give us a review. Big thumbs up in your listening app of choice. Plus, if you know someone else who'd like the show, send them a link because sharing is caring, right? Now, back to the show. If you'd like to hook up with other like-minded folks who are enjoying the pod and chat about the episodes and shows we cover, simply find us at all the usual socials on Facebook, Twitter, and Insta. We'll see you there.
Hey, folks, if you're enjoying this podcast, feel free to give us a review. Big thumbs up in your listening app of choice. Plus, if you know someone else who'd like the show, send them a link because sharing is caring, right? Now, back to the show. If you'd like to hook up with other like-minded folks who are enjoying the pod and chat about the episodes and shows we cover, simply find us at all the usual socials on Facebook, Twitter, and Insta. We'll see you there. Killer Casting is a concept created and produced by me, Lisa Zambetti, with audio engineering by Dean Laffin, logo art by April Laffin, hey and Dean website here. and with big fat opinions request. courtesy of Brian If you're enjoying the show, could you please pop over to your listening app of choice? Give us a nice big 1100 star rating, thumbs up. And if there's anyone Killer you can think of that you believe would enjoy the pod me. as you Killer are, Casting please is a share that link with them because the more the merrier, Lisa Zambetti, right? With audio engineering by Dean Laffin, logo Art by hey, the lovely you, April Laffin website and big old addict. fat opinions courtesy of Ryan to my Allen pods. Hill. But there's one small problem. They're only one way communication. Hey, but you guys, if you're enjoying this podcast, please go over and give us a, a positive six star you can find review us on all the wherever you listen to your podcast. Facebook, Plus, if you know someone who would like the show, please YouTube, send them a link. And we look forward to meeting you in the virtual space. Seems fitting for 2020. All right, later.